Well, hello, FBC. Uh, it's nice to be with you again. I wish we were together in person, but, um, but right now I think we're all just taking whatever we can get. Um, I hope you've had a good week. Um, my week is has been, uh, it's been okay. I can't say that it's been a bad week, nothing especially difficult, but, um, but I found myself kind of hitting that point where I am saying, uh, I think I have gotten all I can out of this uh, stay at home experience. I don't know if anyone out there has kind of hit that point as well, but whatever it is I'm supposed to gain from my um, at home imprisonment, I, I hope I've gained it. I think I've gained it. And now it's time to move on to the next life experience. I mean, things have gotten so bad for me that um, I'm watching and I'm not even going to, I can't believe I'm admitting this online. I, I am watching a fashion design show on TV with my wife. Now, as soon as I say that, that's actually not as bad as it's gotten. It's gotten worse than that. I am now a part of an online Marco Polo group that talks about this TV show about fashion design. I need this to be over quickly before there is permanent damage that is done. I, I need to get out of this soon and return to some level of normalcy uh, before it's too late. And as I was thinking about um, this sermon this week, I realized that the approach that, that I'm having now, kind of the way I've been thinking this week, is really pretty natural for me when I hit periods of, of discouragement or um, challenges or pressures. Uh, I, I want to get out of that as quickly as possible before permanent damage is done. And I don't think that's uncommon. But I was challenged as I, look at, I looked at Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, which is today's passage, that maybe the Lord would want us to have a different mindset. Maybe he would want us to focus on something different. Nothing wrong with trying to get out of those stresses and pressures and, and the afflictions that we're under. But if that's all we're thinking about, we're missing some things that are really important. And Romans 5 is going to unpack that for us. But for us to really get a handle on what's going on in Romans 5, let's just take a quick second to remind ourselves of where we have been in the book of Romans. Remember we've said that the book of Romans divides into two major sections. In the first major section, chapters 1 through 11, we see that God gives us righteousness. And then in the last part of the book, we see that the righteous live by faith. We have done this first uh, subsection under, ver under chapters 1 through 11, which is the need for righteousness. And, and here's what we saw Paul arguing, that we need righteousness because there is no one that is capable of standing, in, standing before the Lord and not being declared absolutely guilty. If it's left to ourselves, it doesn't matter how good we are. It doesn't, there are no excuses that can cover us. We will stand before the Lord and we will be declared guilty. But what he then has taken us into as we've moved um, into the section that we're in now is he has argued, well, this is what righteousness actually is. And he said that what righteousness is, is, is being in a right or being in a harmonious relationship with God. And we get that because Jesus died on the cross and we entered that harmonious relationship when we put our faith in the fact that Jesus died on the cross so that our sins, our rebellion, all those things that make righteousness impossible for us on our own would be forgiven. So that's the section we're in now. He's explaining what righteousness is. And as we move into chapter 5, he is going to, to talk about the ripple effects a little bit of, since this is what righteousness is, here are some of the ramifications of that. And that's what we're going to pick up with today. Now, um, let me tell you what the point of this passage is right up front. The point of this passage is that we have peace with God. You're going to see that in the first two verses, and he's not going to use that terminology again, but the same concept is going to come up in the last two verses uh, of this passage. He is then going to talk about the ramifications of the fact that we've been made right with God and that we have peace with God. And, and the ramifications are that we have a firm foundation that keeps us strong and stable in the face of suffering. He's going to show us why we, need, why we can have hope 
in the face of suffering. And then he's going to show us a deliverance that we have from the wrath of God. And that is, again, kind of him coming back full circle to where he was in the first section of, of the peace that we have with God, that part of that firm foundation. So let's dive in to uh, Romans chapter 5, 1 through 11. And uh, I'm going to focus on first just taking us through the passage, see what's going on. What is Paul's point here? What is he saying? And then we'll take some time teasing out the ramifications for us in uh, the situations that we're facing today. So the firm foundation we find uh, starting in verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So let's just see what Paul is, is doing here. Right here in this less than a full sentence, he has just summarized all of chapters 1 through 4. Don't think about that too long because then you're going to get bitter about the fact that if Paul could summarize four chapters in less than a sentence, why do these sermons need to be so long? But let's just skip right over that. Because this is true, because this is what he's argued in, in chapters 1 through 4, he's going to say there are three extraordinary blessings that we receive from that. We receive peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what does he mean by peace with God? He's not just talking about kind of this calm inner feeling or this sense that um, everything's good with God. That may be there. It may not be there. He's talking about the actual state of fact, the, the state that we are actually in. We do not have conflict with God. That has been removed. We have peace with God. And, and just remember, too, that peace in the Bible doesn't mean just the absence of conflict. Peace in the Bible is also talking about flourishing. So we're now in a relationship with God where we flourish in that relationship. And God desires to see us flourish and thrive. And that's the relationship we have. And so that's the first benefit. And as I said, I think this is kind of the controlling idea that, that he's going to keep coming back to or that, that kind of underlies uh, this whole passage. And he'll come back to again at the end. But then there are also other blessings that we receive. Through him, we also obtain access by faith, into this grace in which we stand. We use the word grace a lot. I love the definition of grace, that it is, what, it is God doing for us what we cannot do for ourselves. We are saved by grace because we cannot save ourselves. So it is God doing for us what we cannot do for ourselves. We grow in Christ by his grace because we can't do that on ourselves, but God helps us and does for us what we cannot do on ourselves. Here's the other thing I really want you to catch, is that it is grace in which we stand. And what I want you to catch is that that is present tense. Right? So often we think that, that God's grace is, is something that we needed at a specific moment so that we could be justified, we could be made right with God, and then grace really doesn't matter or grace doesn't, doesn't factor in as much and it's just all about our hard work from there. Or, or sometimes we think that grace kind of comes and goes and, and sometimes we're experiencing God's grace and sometimes we're experiencing God's righteousness and other times we're experiencing God's holiness and other times we're experiencing God's patience. But, but grace is just kind of something that comes and goes. Do you see that that's not the case? It is grace in which we stand every moment of every day. God's grace is always, constantly, right now, present in our lives. And that's an extraordinary blessing, an extraordinary promise. We don't have to live as if God saved us and then abandoned us to our own efforts or that God sometimes is angry at us and sometimes is gracious towards us. God is always, in every moment, gracious towards us. There's a third blessing. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. See, hope in the Bible is not just kind of wishful thinking. Hope is a certain expectation. Think, think about a, um, a child on Christmas Eve who has hope for what is coming the next morning. There is a confident expectation 
of what is coming. They just haven't experienced it yet, and they long to experience it. And that's what hope in the Bible looks like. And what it is that we have confident expectation of, what it is that we long to experience, is the glory of God. And obviously that refers to heaven. It refers to the time that we will be able to experience God the way we were meant to. We will, we will see his character. We will see his glory. And we will be in his dwelling place. But I want us to also note that that's not all that's part of, of experiencing the glory of God. That's not all that we look forward to. Another part of it is that we will reflect the glory of in character of God, in the way that we were meant to, the way that deep down we desire to. And that is part of our hope. It's not just what we receive, but it's who we become. And that's going to be an important theme that Paul develops in the next section. I call this our firm foundation because these blessings are what give us strength and stability in a world that gives us pain and suffering, right? We need the strength and stability that comes from knowing that God is on our side. We need the strength and stability of knowing that God's grace never for one moment leaves us, which means that he will always be on our side. And that also means that he will always be accomplishing through us and in us what we could never accomplish on our own. And we need the certainty, we need the confident expectation that one day, Everything that we long for is going to actually happen and come true. We will be the people that we are meant to be. We will see God and experience God without any of the stain or, or, or uh, burden of being fallen and sinful. See, we need the foundation of peace with God, God's constant grace, and the certainty of our hope because we live in a world that constantly disappoints us and constantly wounds us. And that's exactly where Paul goes next in this next section, uh, which picks up in verse 3. Paul is talking about the fact that being made right with God gives us hope in suffering. Before we dive into the passage, um, I want to ask you a question. Which kind of person would you rather be? Right. This is taken from another letter that Paul wrote uh, from Galatians 5. And this isn't the full description of these people he gives there, but it's enough for us to answer the question. Would you, do you want to be a self-centered, jealous, divisive, angry, arrogant, and immoral person? Or would you rather be a person characterized by love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control? Which of those two would you rather be? I think deep down, we know two things about our answer. We know that deep down... Even if we don't always act it, even if we make jokes that it's not who we want to be, uh, we want to be that second person. We have something inside of us that says, this is who I was designed to be. This is what I want to be. This is what I long for. But the other thing that we know deep down inside of us is there is a lot of that first person that operates in our lives. And so the key question that we live with, that we struggle with internally, is how does this person become that person? And starting in verse 3, Paul is going to answer that question in an extraordinarily shocking way. Because what Paul is going to say is that God uses suffering to make this transformation happen. So let's pick up in verse 3. Not only that, not only do we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. You see, he is introducing us to a process that starts with suffering. Now, suffering is not something that is... Um, this word in Greek doesn't just refer to like the major life-threatening circumstances. It's a word that's actually applied to the normal everyday pressures of life. And he is saying that this is something that we can rejoice in. Now, he doesn't say rejoice because of. So he's not saying that, that as we go through the pressures and burdens and, and, and 
challenges of life that we say, hey, this is great, isn't this fun? I'm so excited this is happening. That's not what he's saying here. What he's saying here is we can still call things that are bad, bad, and we can call things that are evil, evil, and we can say that when we experience them that it is wrong and it shouldn't be this way and we want it to end, but we rejoice because God is at work even in those situations to do something extraordinary. And what he's doing is laid out in uh, the rest of these verses. Suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character, and character produces hope. So he has described a process that looks like this. The fallen, broken world is going to put us in positions where we suffer or experience pressures or disappointments or frustrations of life. The one thing in this whole process that we do is we endure. Everything else is a work of the Holy Spirit. We endure, the Holy Spirit uses that endurance that we have in the midst of suffering to transform our character to be more like Christ and to help us to strengthen our hope, our confident expectation in the glory of God that one day we will reflect his character the way that we want and one day we will be in his presence and enjoy his character in the way that we long for. That's what we're hoping for here. Now, the reality is, that's not usually how I react to suffering. The way I react to suffering goes something like this. I experience something in the world, then I search for an escape, an exit, as fast as I can. I want to get out of watching these fashion design shows just as quickly as I can. So I take urgent action, even if it's not right. And I tell my wife, I'm just really sick tonight. I need to go spend... Uh, the evening upstairs doing something else. And my hope is not for transformation for me and my character. My hope is not for a world where suffering is removed uh, that we will experience when we are in heaven. My hope is simply for escape. I want to get out. And so you see in the normal situation, what is completely missing is anything about endurance and anything about the change in my character. There's nothing wrong with wanting to get out of a difficult, painful situation as quickly as we can. The problem comes when we leave out what God is doing through our endurance to change our character. So this is what that process looks like in a little bit more detail. What do we do? What does it mean for us to endure? For us to endurance literally means to keep going under pressure. And what is it that we're supposed to keep going and doing? Well, what's our fundamental assignment as Christians? Our fundamental core assignment is to abide with Christ. It is to be in relationship with him and grow in that relationship with him. It is to learn him, uh, to learn about him more and to fall more and more in love with him. Every other assignment we have in the Christian life grows out of that, whether it's the assignment for outreach or evangelism or fellowship or worship. Every other assignment grows out of that core assignment that we are to abide with Christ, that we are to grow in our relationship. So what does it mean to endure? It means to continue to abide in Christ And in the midst of our sufferings, we grow in relationship with him. And how does that look practically? Well, we do things like this. We we ask the Lord, what does it mean to follow Jesus' example in the midst of what we're experiencing? So so take stay-at-home orders. What does it mean to follow Jesus' example? Well, what does Jesus do when he's alone? When Jesus is alone, he rests. That's important. That's probably something I have not done well in following his example. Jesus takes his alone time to connect with his Father. And Jesus takes his alone time to pray. And that's just a wonderful starting place to say, what does it mean to abide in Christ in the midst of a stay-at-home order we take that time to rest the way Jesus did. We take that time to connect with our Heavenly Father through His Word, through fellowship, um, and we take that time for prayer, for ourselves, for others, for God's glory to be evident throughout the world. 
And we can also just ask the Lord to show us what he's doing in our lives during this time. How is the Holy Spirit working on our character? How is he giving us hope? You see, if the end of the process is hope, if that's what we're going for here, then one of the things that we need as well, if we're going to endure, is the assurance. It's the the demonstration, the proof. That hope is actually going to be fulfilled. That There's a reason to have confidence, ex- confident expectation. And so that's actually what Paul does next in this section in verses 5 through 8. And hope does not put us to shame. In other words, hope doesn't let us down. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who, was, who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God showed his love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, in verse 5, what he's giving us is kind of the inward proof, if you want to use the word subjective proof. He's saying that God's love gives us the Holy Spirit. Now, just before I talk about that, can we just note here that God just didn't give us his love? God poured his love. He lavished his love in us. It wasn't just this minor thing. This this is just an absolute outpouring of God's love. And he does that through the Holy Spirit. What the Holy Spirit does is he gives us that inward testimony that, that we are loved by God, and that God is with us. And the Holy Spirit is the very presence of God in our life. He never, ever leaves us. That in and of itself is an extraordinary act of God. And that's the inward testimony. That's the inward proof. But there's also an an outward, if you want to say that, or an objective proof that Paul talks about in verse 6. For when we are still weak, and he means spiritually, Just at that time when we needed him, Christ died for the ungodly. What we can look to is absolute objective proof of God's love that we never have to question God's love is that Christ died for us when we were ungodly. And these two verses unpack just the dynamic love that that is. It's saying that we will never experience a love like that anywhere else other than in Christ. God's love for us isn't just the love for us when we were good people or a righteous person. It was God's love for us when we were corrupt and ugly and ungodly. God showed his love for us while we were sinners, while we were God's enemies, it's going to say in two verses, by sending Jesus to the cross. We never need to doubt when God promises that we will see his glory and we will reflect his glory. We never have to doubt because God has proved his love for us in the most extraordinary ways possible. He's given us the Holy Spirit and he sent his son to the cross when we had in no way deserved to be died for. My natural tendency, if I'm really honest, is to strive. I I want to be uh, battling internally for how I get out of this situation, how I get things back to normal as fast as possible. But that's not enduring. Again, there's nothing wrong with trying to get out of a situation that's a bad situation. But that's not enduring. And enduring is not just clenching our fists and and hating every moment of it and, and just trying to survive. And enduring is not acting like I'm excited about something that's bad or evil. Enduring is acknowledging that a fallen world has dropped a rock on my life. And it's accepting and saying, this is not the way things are supposed to be. But then I go forward with confidence. I go forward with confidence that I am at peace with God, that he is on my side, that his grace is at work in my life. 
every single moment and that God's plans for renewal in my life and restoration and the removal of all this suffering is someday going to work out. See, when we respond to Jesus' death on the cross with faith, we are justified and we are made right with God. And as a result of that, we have this foundation that allows us to stand strong and stable and we have hope for what God is doing in our suffering as we endure. And there's one final thing that we have that's identified in this passage, and that is that we are made, by being made right with God, God delivers us from wrath. It starts in verse 9, Since therefore we now have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies... We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. You see, being made right with God radically changes our relationship with God. And as I said earlier, he's really kind of cycling back to what he said in verses 1 and 2 about being at peace with God. But he's saying it in a different way. See, we were people who were under God's wrath, but now we are saved from it. And think about the power of what verse 10 is saying. We were God's enemies. We weren't neutral. We certainly weren't God's friends and on his side. But we were, in fact, God's enemies. And it doesn't matter if you were like me. I came to Christ when I was six years old. But up until that point, even though I was just a little kid, I was an enemy of God. And that is a remarkable thing to get our minds around. But it's important to get our minds around it because then we can really understand the power of his love. When we are his enemies in that condition, we were reconciled to God. And this word reconciled is, is a relational term that was used a lot of, of um, military forces or of uh, military leaders or political leaders who were hostile and at war with one another, but the hostilities have ceased. And that is what he is saying here. That's why he's kind of cycling back to being at peace with God. He's saying hostilities have ceased, not because of anything that we did. We were his enemies. It is because of what God did through Jesus Christ that we now have received reconciliation. God is our ally. We never have to fear that our suffering is a sign of God's rejection or a sign of God's wrath against us because we have been reconciled. We are at peace with him and we have been delivered from his wrath. Well, that's the passage. Like I said, I think Paul's point here is that we are at peace with God and then he is developing the ramifications of that. So what does that mean for us today given what we are struggling with? And I want to suggest uh, two kind of big picture applications for us. And, And it's really about the mindset. What should we be focusing on if we're not focusing on How do we get out of this as quickly as we can? And living in the anxiety of, of, I need to get out of this right now. How do we, if you want to say, how do we rest in the reality of the situation that we are in? There are two things that are critical in in that mindset that come from this passage. And the first one is that we are to rejoice. Did you notice that we are told three times in this passage to rejoice. We are to rejoice in the hope of God's glory. We rejoice in the certain future that there will be with God and that we will experience him as we are meant to and we will reflect his character the way that we are meant to. We are to rejoice in our suffering. God is at work in our suffering because God uses it to change us into the very person that we long to be. And then it says at the end that we are to rejoice in God himself. We are to rejoice in this wonderful, this, this wonderful creator, sustainer of the universe who loved us when we were his enemies, who pursued us when we were his enemies and reconciled us to him when we were his enemies. This is the one who loves us infinitely. And we just need to take some time reflecting on these things and take time in prayer, rejoicing, 
that we have this hope that God is at work in our sufferings and that God is the God who pursued us when we were his enemies. The second thing that we need to do is we need to endure, right? This was very clear uh, from, the, from the passage that this is how we are to respond to suffering. So uh, some questions that I think will help you if you will slow down and spend some time while you're in um, your own version of isolation to just think about that will help you in, endure in the way that God calls us to. In other words, another way of saying this is that we need to stop fighting and we need to start paying attention. And so we do that by doing things like asking what fears are being stirred up inside of us? What, what insecurities, what discontentment are we experiencing right now? And, and then to then to slow down and say, okay, well, what's going on behind those scenes, right? What do those fears and insecurities and discontentment reveal about what I believe about God and, and what I believe about my relationship with God? And just to use myself as an example, I, uh, I feel discontent when I'm not productive, at least not as productive in the way that I want to, um, in the way that I think I'm supposed to. And so I, I feel like, I'm just not as valuable or as important. Well, what does that tell me about what I believe about God and how he relates to me? It tells me that, that I don't think God's approval of me is enough. I don't think it is enough for me to be considered valuable. And I maybe even question if God really does think I'm valuable uh, if I'm not producing. And so I have to start coming to grips with what's behind those fears and, incons- and insecurities and discontentment. Remember we looked at that first person from Galatians 5, that person who was self-centered and divisive and all this. Well, why is that person like that? Usually it's because they're reacting to fears and insecurities and discontentment in their lives, and they are doing so without the power of the Holy Spirit, and that, that leads to those types of character traits and behaviors. And so we need to understand what's going on underneath us. And God uses suffering to bubble those things up so we can come to grips with them. And and then we need to ask questions like, why are we so like the person that we don't want to be like? What's going on there? And then how does it help to know the peace, the grace, and the hope that is found only in God that offsets what's going on that's causing us to be that that person that we don't want to be. Think about, reflect on these types of questions because this is ultimately how we endure and we take the truth of God's word and we set it up against the fears and insecurities and discontentment that we have and that the Holy Spirit uses to transform our character. We have a foundation that gives us strength and stability. That foundation is key if we are going to endure in the midst of suffering. And as we endure, we see that our suffering produces the character that we long for, to be like Christ, and it produces and it confirms and strengthens our hope. And we are delivered from God's wrath, and so we never once have to question if what we are going through is because God is rejecting us or God is angry at us. See, the point of the passage, as I've said, is that you are at peace with God. But there's an implication for that passage that is directly relevant to what we are dealing with today. And that implication is that we need to stop fighting the circumstances we're in and start paying attention to what God is doing. Stop fighting and start paying attention. Some other practical ways that you can think about responding. Uh, Rewrite the passage in your own words. Again, I want to continue to leave that challenge in front of us because as you do that, that's part of what the Holy Spirit is going to use to help you endure in the midst of suffering as you engage in God's word in that way. Take some time to rejoice in prayer, as we've said. Spend some time thanking God for the hope that you have in the midst of your suffering. Spend some time thanking God for who he is and for uh, how he has pursued you even when you are his enemies. And then endure. Reflect on how God is using this time in your life 
to make you more like Christ and to strengthen the hope that is ahead of you. Would you close with me in prayer that we would be able to rejoice and endure in the suffering that we encounter today? Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your love and your work in our lives. Lord, we thank you that even in the midst of stay-at-home orders, of quarantine, of isolation, of a deadly virus, Lord, even in the midst of all of that, we have hope. And we know that you are working to produce character within us. Lord, forgive us for how we have not cared about the character that you are producing in the midst of suffering, how we have not cared about the strengthening of our hope, how we have only cared about getting out of the problem and out of the situation as fast as we could. Lord, help us to rest in you in the midst of this situation and help us with that even today. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So here's what we've said about who God is. God is at work in your life during this time of deadly viruses, during this time of isolation and stay-at-home orders and massive disruptions to our lives. He is at work in you right now to accomplish what you cannot accomplish on your own. And he is changing you to be like Christ. So your job as we leave this uh, time together is for you to stop fighting the situation that you are in and start paying attention to what God is doing right now in your life. Thank you for joining with us. Just a reminder, um, I know this was shared earlier, but you do have a button that you can hit if you need prayer. We're going to keep the service going for a little bit, and uh, there will be folks here that can pray with you. Uh, and also, if you do not know the Savior, if you have never entered into or put faith in uh, Jesus to save you from God's wrath, to, to change you through suffering, and to give you peace with God, then there's a button that would indicate that you would like to do that, and we would like to connect with you so we can walk with you through that process. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you for being a part of our service today. I look forward to connecting with you in real life just as soon as possible. Mm-hmm.